Hi, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Catherine Clark. The Right Honourable Joe Clark was Canada's youngest Prime Minister and Canada's only Alberta-born Prime Minister. He's also my dad and I'm thrilled to have Joe Clark join me now in Ottawa for a chat about life beyond politics. Joe Clark, yeah. welcome to Beyond Politics. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here, Dad. Very pleased to be it here. It was Thank really you. tough to arrange this interview with you. <laughs> I just couldn't get you to hammer down a time. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm glad you're here. Um, I have to admit, though, that this is probably one of the most, um, well, I suppose I should, nerve-wracking is probably the best way to describe an interview. Generally, I'm interviewing people that I don't know much about, but I grew up with you, so... Although reading your biography, I learned a whole bunch of things I didn't know. The um, David Humphrey's biography. Yes. So it was. This has been an interesting experience all around. I tried to keep as much as I could from it. <laughs> <laughs> now I figure it out. Yeah. Um, one of the things that struck me, and of course from my memories um, as a kid too, um, about High River and and what an impact that growing up in High River and in a small town in Alberta had on you as a person. And I wondered what it was like for you growing up in that town, in High River specifically, as a kid in the 1940s and 50s. Well, in a sense, that was all we knew. Uh, when you live in a globalized age now with television and all of these things, it was literally all you know. Uh, that was driven home once to me. My dad had a ham radio, and it had unusual uh, reach, which meant that uh, he could listen to a world champion boxing match being fought somewhere in the United States, and his was the only radio in town uh, that could reach it. And so here I was, six or seven years old, and all these people were in our den listening to, uh, I think it was Joe Lewis and Billy Kahn. Uh, and that's sort of a symbol of how, uh, I don't say remote, but self-contained those communities were. And it, I, it was a very fortunate community. I sort of knew that without thinking about it, but in retrospect, when I have been exposed to the conditions others lived in. I was very privileged. We weren't, we weren't rich, we weren't poor, but um, uh, we were very fortunate in living in a place that was a place and give you, gave you a sense of some roots. It was also a beautiful place. It, uh, as our newspaper used to say, we, we sat between the, uh, the prairies and the, uh, and the mountains. And so you had the great stretch of the prairies to the east, and you had those massive mountains that looked, in fact, like you could walk to them. Uh, we often had uh, guests from away who would get up early in the morning, they'd look out, they'd think the mountains were a, a mile away. There was a farmer a little bit west of us named Soderberg, and he used to phone my dad and say, Charlie, we've got another one, you better come and <laughs> rescue him, because they'd got that far and were still miles from the mountains. But it was a spectacle, it, there was a real sense of community there. And what's interesting in my later life was that I find that sense of community in many places in Canada, not just rural. It's very much a feature of, uh, of urban life in Canada, too. You also had parents who were very actively involved in the community and um, in their own ways as well. I mean, Grandma was a, a teacher mm -hmm. and uh, Grandpa ran the newspaper. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did that impact uh, your growing up too, knowing that you, not just that you had two parents who were very much involved in the everyday life of the community, um, but did it also impact you knowing that you could never get away with anything? It was very tough being a student. Uh, I mean, not tough. It was, uh, if there was any discipline to be meted out, uh, it came to us first. We were told uh, by, by my mom and, that, and by, my <laughs> by George Harper, the uh, principal, uh, that uh, any teacher's kid who got the least bit out of line would be back in line very quickly. But generally, uh, they were active in the community in very different ways. They were very different people. Uh, my mom was the sort of driver in the family and the worrier. Uh, my dad, I suppose, almost at the other extreme, was the dreamer in the family and the extrovert. He was also one of the... He was, a, he was an easy writer and an easy-to-meet person. And one of the things that I didn't realize until later was that there were a lot of highly able people in the town, highly skilled. One of the world's best saddle makers uh, lived in the High River. 
and they would from time to time be celebrated, but they had no skill at all in public. And so most of the effect of public speaking that was uh, that emanated from High River was written, in fact, by my dad. Wow. That people would come by and say, would, would you do this? The other great thing, in retrospect, I knew nothing about this at the time, was that because we ran a community newspaper, a weekly newspaper, which was part of a very large weekly newspaper family. These were all, most of them, individually owned. There were no chains then. And they were great friends, uh, the people in these papers. And they were often quite, uh, in their way, eccentric personalities. But there was an annual convention each year, and whether it was, uh, and, and there were always people coming to or from the convention who would stop at our house. And here you'd have these people from Windsor, Nova Scotia, or from uh, somewhere in British Columbia that I had no idea where it was. But they had a different view of the country. Uh, they talked about where they had come from. So well before I went to any of these places, I had a sense of what they were. And uh, that, um, I think that that caused me to treat it as sort of normal, to uh, go out beyond uh, where I came from. Grandma, you talked about Grandma being a strong person, and um, I wondered how much that influenced you as a person as well. It just was sort of second nature to her to be active in things. And her father, whom I barely knew, he died when I was two or three, uh, he had raised two daughters, and uh, he, um, uh, he'd come from a sort of a hard background himself, and he made sure they got the best training they could. They went to university. Uh, and went out and, uh, and taught. Um, but a striking feature, again, that I didn't realize till I was gone, I grew up, uh, you, you don't remember when the Second World War was, but I do, uh, because I grew up in High River during the Second World War. The men were away. The women ran the town. And so it was sort of normal to see women doing things in High River and in that era uh, that uh, they might not have done, uh, have done otherwise. And um, I think it is truly the case that it never occurred to me that there was a capacity uh, difference. And, uh, and there's no doubt that affected my, uh, uh, my view of, uh, of life later. And it's one of the things I must say that I look back at my career that I'm, I'm, I'm proud of because uh, circumstances uh, uh, happened to change at a, at a point where I could be of some influence on them. And, uh, uh, I think everybody's better off that uh, that those things happen. You, um, we talked about the fact that the that your family owned the newspaper, and that would have played a, a big part in your life. Did you write for the newspaper? Yes, I wrote, wrote for the newspaper. You won't believe this, but I actually had a job that required some mechanical precision. <laughs> I, I had to. We had to cut some of these sheets by uh, with a big uh, s slicing instrument and. Uh, I you have all your fingers. And I didn't lose a finger, <laughs> no, and it was fairly. But I, uh, I did a lot of writing. But I'll tell you one thing about that sort of physical kinds of things. Uh, this was a long time ago in, in printing, and uh, we had something called a linotype machine. We had four or five uh, printing machines in the back office. And I remember one day I was sitting in Dad's office. I was being chastised for something, and there was the usual sort of noise in the back office. And suddenly he stopped and he said, excuse me. He said, excuse me to me. Yeah. And he got up and he went into the uh, back shop. And it happened that a screw was loose on the linotype machine, one of four presses out there. He knew all of that well enough that he knew what it was and how it had to be fixed. And I think it was at that time that I decided, I can't do this. <laughs> I have to do something else. Uh, but I wrote. I wrote for the... Um, I don't need to tell you that I'm not a natural athlete, uh, but I was interested in sports. So and I, you're a great follower of sports. I am, but I began then, I think, um, uh, and I used to write about sports for the uh, High River Times, principally hockey, uh, and uh, I think that had my dad not been the publisher, the, there would not have been quite that quotient of hockey coverage <laughs> in, the, in the Times, but um, well, that was... That was you uh, know, on that front, I have to tell you that... Um, People probably don't know much about how interested in sports you actually are mm. and how much you love baseball mm. and how many games I've had to sit through <laughs> with you scoring the game. Yeah. And I have a very vivid memory, too, of being in New York. Yeah. And um, I, we were probably there for the UN. Yeah. And I was old enough to be embarrassed. And um, 
you and Jody White and the rest of the staff all stood up and started singing at very high levels, take me out to the ball game. You certainly and did. it has been a scarring memory <laughs> ever since. Oh, I remember you covering under the. Uh, <laughs> I, I under did. The I hid under a chair. I know you did. I remember yeah. that. No, uh, I used to pride myself, and I could still probably do what I want today, but I could uh, name the uh, the roster of the Brooklyn Dodgers in the years they won the. Uh, uh, they won the World Series, uh, partly because I was president of the high school students union at the time, and I had a friend who was our custodian, who was also a baseball fan, but he had a radio in the basement, uh, and he would come uh, at, on day games, he would come and sort of knock on the teacher's door and say, I have to see the president of the student council. So off I would go, and we'd go downstairs into the basement, and I would listen to the, uh, to the, the Dodgers play, whomever they were playing, while everybody else was reading about reciting some poetry up in the, uh, uh, so it served, me well. it served me well. Um, you realized that probably working within uh, the newspaper business, or at least the family business of running the paper was not for you. Hmm. Uh, what was going to be for you? Did you know? No, I didn't. And, you know, I taught at the University of Alberta for a while afterwards. And one of the things that uh, comforted me a little bit was that I realized that a lot of my first-year students didn't know either. They knew they wanted to do something. Many of them knew they wanted to go beyond where they were. Uh, and so they had, they had gone to, to, uh, to university. But um, uh, I think what drove me to university, and I sort of, I had not really planned on it, but I had become a junior reporter for the Calgary Herald. I, looked, I wrote obituaries and other important things. <laughs> And, uh, uh, but I also, there was a big newsroom then, and I was interested in sports. And one night, Calgary had a professional baseball team then. And one night, our um, normal sports reporter was, how do I say this, indisposed. Yes, okay. uh, so I uh, was sent out to report this, uh, this Calgary ball team and uh, came back very much. That was a great thing to do. And I told my mom about it, who immediately became, became concerned that I was going to be a sports writer, and that would be the end of me. So uh, the pressure grew to uh, go to U of A. Another interesting thing what about What did they the, want you to be, Don? I'm sorry to interrupt, but did they tell you what they wanted you to be No, then? they didn't know. What, I, I don't, if they knew what they wanted me to do, uh, they didn't tell me. But, but they definitely clear. did not want you to be a sports writer. Yeah, the they, uh, my mother particularly, uh, uh, she was determined that both Peter and I would go on to, uh, to university, and uh, we did, yeah. and uh, we then sort of followed our own, uh, our own courses there. What interested me in sort of national, I naturally gravitated to the college newspaper uh, when I went there, the Gateway, yes. which was great fun. It was really a great uh, group of people. And you became editor. I became Within, editor. you know, a very short period well, of time. Well, yeah, we were there three years. A, a good friend of mine, Bob Scammell, had been the editor before, and we, uh, uh, he, we, he promoted me. And we had, a, we had a lot of fun at the, uh, the paper. I nearly got expelled, in fact, because we published something called a gag edition. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this one claimed that uh, the then premier of Alberta, Ernest Manning, was in fact Amy Semple McPherson incarnate. Now, Amy Semple McPherson was a, had been a, a, a female evangelist who had disappeared into the ocean, uh, but had been a powerful evangelist when she came back. The story doesn't matter. <laughs> the university was very upset, and uh, naturally. Because and he was in power at the time? He was in was power at the time, and it was, it was an irreverent approach to, uh, to public life, I have to say. They confiscated as many of the papers as they could, although I have a few... Uh, uh, still, and they considered disciplinary action, and they were going to, um, uh, I think they were considering expelling me, but the dean of the law school intervened and uh, defended me, and it ended up that they cut my salary. I received a stipend of $500 a year as editor. They cut that in half. I went to speak to the dean, Dean Wilbur Bowker, and I said, thank you, Dean Bowker, for defending the rights of the free expression. And he looked at me and he said, young man, that has nothing to do with it. I went to school with your mother and she deserves better than this. <laughs> it was a great uh, uh, indication of uh, parental influence mattering, at least in that case. You know, you probably could have had fun with the journalism career, though. You would have been writing, which you are mm -hmm. very good at and in, enjoy for the most part. 
and you would have been covering current affairs, but it seems that you always came back to politics, that there was always an interest on every level for you um, in politics. Yeah. Did, you, did you realize that yourself? Did you think it was just a passing interest or a side interest to another career? When did it become the focus of a career? It really became the focus of a career here, because I, here in Ottawa, because I won an Adventure in Citizenship uh, Award from the Rotary Club back in 1956. And uh, I had a choice. I could go to two places, interestingly. One was the United Nations, the other was Ottawa. Wow. For reasons I don't yet understand, I came to Ottawa. And uh, I was here during uh, the historic pipeline debate, which really changed the government. That was the issue on which Mr. Diefenbaker later became prime minister. Uh, but I was here as a youngster. I saw these long, long lines outside the House of Commons, people trying to get in. I stood in those lines. I finally got in on a Friday afternoon. The line broke, and in I went. And it was, it had, I, I knew nothing about private members' hour, but the, de the full debate, day's debate was over. It was private members' hour. There was a fellow, a member of parliament for Medicine Hat, who was discussing three miles of railway line between Princess and Patricia in southeastern Alberta. Maybe that's why the line broke, Dad. Maybe it is. <laughs> Maybe it is. But it, it became a, um, that was an exciting time to be here. I then went back to High River. I was again, as I said, student council president. Dad told me that, and Mr. Diefenbaker was coming to town. Dad told me that um, as council president, I was an official of the town. And when the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition came to town, all officials had to turn out. So there I was, 20 years younger than anyone else in the hall. He spoke, and it was one of those riveting speeches you had to be there to hear, but he talked about uh, the country from the perspective of a Western Canadian. And uh, on the way out, here I was sitting at the back, and John Diefenbaker came and sat down beside me and said, uh, what are you going to do, young man? Uh, and I, I don't recall the, the answer. I do recall the question. And that sort of personal contact that I had with him was, uh, was really quite um, uh, transforming in my life. And then events went on. It was an exciting time in Alberta because Mr. Diefenbaker had won the, the national government. Uh, the provincial party uh, had new life in it. I became involved in that. My parents had not been because a weekly newspaper editor at that time, uh, it was a, you, you became involved in politics at your peril. We did not have a huge circulation, 2,000, 2,500 people. And if you lost um, 40 social creditors, particularly if they were uh, advertisers. That was a, a major problem for the, uh, uh, for the paper. But from that point on, I became involved in... Um, I was uh, uh, minding my own business in Alberta once when the, the national president of the Progressive Conservative Student Federation came through. His name was Ted Rogers. Oh. And he said, um, I need a communications director. And uh, I said, yes. And he said, I'm naming you one. And I said, this is a political party. Aren't there elections? He said, not on my board. <laughs> <laughs> so I became involved in, uh, in national uh, affairs then. You ran provincially uh, first and lost, but I think you were a sacrificial candidate, as I understand it. I Although you almost, you almost... Yeah, what won. happened, I was the organizer. And uh, we, <laughs> we had a wonderful man named Fred Peacock, uh, a wealthy man who was our candidate, wanted to be in the house with Peter Lawhey. But he also had enough money to hire a pollster when nobody else could do that. And there was a pollster for Labatt's Brewery uh, who uh, did a poll, and um, uh, his name was Ben Crow, did a poll that showed this was the worst writing he'd ever seen for a challenging candidate. So Fred dropped out, and uh, I was the, the election was coming, I was the organizer, I had to find a candidate. I couldn't find one. We had two members in that riding, uh, signed up members. But the High River Times had 46 subscribers, so uh, I converted them all to the PC party. Uh, they nominated me. And Peter Law, he'd won six seats that year. Had he won eight, I would have been in the legislature. Wow. Uh, we knew it was going to be close, and I had a... Uh, what Ben Crow had told Fred Peacock was, uh, when Peacock said, is it really that bad? He said, uh, well... Uh, there was the virgin birth, as though anything can happen. And I had a telegram all set to send to Ben Crow saying, come to Bethlehem and see. <laughs> but I didn't get a chance, uh, chance to send it. 
I'm going to skip forward a bit just so that we have time to, to speak about um, things later in your life. Um, you ran and won uh, under Mr. Stanfield federally. Uh, you came from behind and became leader of the party only four years after you mm -hmm. were first elected. Um, and then you became the youngest prime minister in Canadian history. Mm -hmm. The only person to ever defeat Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Mm -hmm. um, did you realize, did you feel at the time um, how young you were? You were 39 years old. Did you feel young at that time? Did, or did you feel, because of all the events around you, that you were um, not as young as everyone? I suppose I kept denying the, the view that I was too young. Looking back on it, I certainly felt young. Uh, I think that had I been a couple of years older, had a couple more years experience, I would have found a way to have the budget passed. That, not only brought down my government, but really changed history in the country because some of the most egregious things that Mr. Trudeau did uh, afterwards were in that, that term after uh, I had defeated him and he had defeated me. Uh, and as I look back at my photographs uh, with uh, uh, very, uh, I, for some reason, God knows why, I used to wear these vests and I, I don't know what little Lord Fauntleroy looked like, but I, I was as close an approximation as you could find. I think that was just the style. Well, it was, it was not a style that was widely shared or widely appreciated <laughs> by, the, by the press gallery or anybody else. So I was young, um, but um, that was also an asset. People were looking for a change. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Stanfield had elected a first-class uh, group of colleagues of mine, most of whom were young, all of whom represented new, uh, a sense of newness. And there was a real sense in the country that it was time for a change. Uh, there was some animosity against Mr. Trudeau, which was strong, of course. But there was also this very real sense that there needed to be a change. And uh, we represented that. And I think in that sense, my, uh, uh, my age was not the... Uh, uh, my age was an asset in, uh, in that uh, sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, it meant that we, uh, uh, we undertook things. I think that other people... We tried to do things... Uh, that other people um, uh, hadn't tried before. After you lost the leadership in 1983, you decided to stay on. You decided to run again uh, and serve under Mr. Mulroney. And, and I've always wondered why you decided to stay instead of taking, uh, going into the private sector or, or, or pursuing um, another challenge in life. I enjoyed the life. Um, I also had a sense of obligation um, I think that one of the remarkable things Brian Mulroney and I were able to do together was overcome our differences, were, which were deeper than just that I won once and he won once. We're very different people. Uh, we share a lot of, a lot of common goals, uh, but not every uh, challenger in a, in a political campaign can, can uh, uh, come together and build a future as, as successfully as, as Brian and I did. And uh, I give him a lot of credit for that, but I take a lot of credit for that. And one of the things that uh, I felt after I had... I'd run in that second campaign, the second leadership campaign, which I lost, uh, saying those of us who... Um, uh, saying the party has to come together. And uh, I believe that there could have been difficulties in the election uh, if uh, I had sort of gone off into the, the, um, the darkness or into some other life. And so I, I wanted to do it. I enjoyed it. Um, I felt my participation was uh, essential, uh, not just important, but essential at that time. And uh, it turned out that, we, that I was given very challenging things to do mm -hmm. uh, later on. You served as, as um, Foreign Minister, Secretary mm -hmm. of State for External Affairs, mm -hmm. uh, for many years after. And then, um, you know, obviously I'm your daughter, so I remain proud of you, but it is widely, you are widely um, noted as being one of the most successful mm -hmm. foreign ministers uh, the country has ever known outside of uh, Lester B. Pearson. And so many things happened mm -hmm. while you were foreign mm -hmm. affairs minister. I mean, enormous things for the history of the world. And I wondered um, what in particular, uh, if there was a particular mo moment that stands out. There's one moment that nothing could surpass. I had been uh, I was leading the Commonwealth Committee of Foreign Ministers on Southern Africa because Canada was playing a very active role in, uh, in the fight against apartheid. 
And uh, the people who made the difference there were South Africans, but we undoubtedly uh, made a difference in that campaign. And when Mr. Mandela was released, uh, he um, came out to meet uh, the African National Congress, his party, in exile. And uh, I was invited as chairman of the, uh, the Commonwealth Committee to be there. There was one other uh, white person there who was the, uh, the foreign minister of the European Union at the time who'd been active. We were sitting in this room in Lusaka, Zambia. Uh, Nelson Mandela walked in to the people who had supported him in prison and uh, in battle lines uh, through his career. Uh, there were only about 90 people there, including uh, visitors. He took some questions. The first question was very critical of the Afrikaans, the, uh, uh, who had been at the backbone of the apartheid uh, movement and who had been his captors uh, and prison guards. And Nelson Mandela looked at these people who'd fought for him for freedom from the, uh, the Afrikaans for so long, and he said to them, we have to remember how difficult this is for them. And I thought, wow, uh, here's this man who's been in prison all his life uh, with that sense of generosity and the need to, uh, uh, to reconcile, uh, to reach over differences. And it's the sort of thing that people talk about in sermons, but you rarely see in action. And I was privileged uh, to be in that room uh, when that happened. And I think it was the sort of uh, uh, example that one only sees rarely in life, anyone only sees rarely in life. And I was privileged to be there. There were lots of other great events, things that we did. I was a successful foreign minister because we had a great department. Uh, I had uh, first-class leadership and cooperation from uh, my prime minister and support from my colleagues. And the Department of External Affairs, uh, the people working in it, were superb. Uh, they were imaginative. They were professional. I've always believed, with regard to public servants, that if you, in, if you establish a good relation with them and encourage them to bring out their best, they will be extraordinarily helpful to a minister. It's not a partisan thing at all. They're not a partisan body. But if you encourage them, uh, they will deliver in spades, and they uh, certainly did uh, for me and for us. Dad, I'm really grateful that you took the time. Thank you. It's just been a real pleasure to be able to talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.